Well, good evening. My name is Bruce Campbell. I'm the chair of the Center for Earth and Planetary Studies here at the National Air and Space Museum. Welcome to the third talk in our series for this year of Exploring Space Lectures. Uh, first of all, let me start by thanking our sponsors, two companies who have been instrumental in providing the equipment that has both launched and propelled spacecraft, many of uh, whose discoveries we see here in these series. That would be United Launch Alliance and Aerojet Rocketdyne. Please join me in thanking them. And it's my pleasure tonight to introduce Michael Brown. Uh, he is the Richard and Barbara Rosenberg Professor of Planetary Astronomy at Caltech. He is, of course, famous for discovering uh, numerous Kuiper Belt objects and for having authored that book about uh, killing Pluto. Uh, throughout his career, he's received many awards. He's received the Yuri Prize. He's received the Feynman Prize and the Kavli Prize in astrophysics. Uh, and tonight, of course, he'll be telling us all about the mysterious uh, search for Planet Nine. Uh, please join me in welcoming Mike Brown. So this is strange, I've never done this where I like do questions for half an hour ahead of time and then pretend like I'm being introduced right now for the first time. So it's like, so it's kind of fun. It's like, oh, I know all you people, this is good. Um, so as we have been discussing, uh, I'm gonna talk about this, this search for this latest planet um, at the edge of the solar system. And, and uh, I cannot talk about this without really bringing you back for uh, a couple of hundred years thinking about all of the planets that have been discovered in the solar system. So I want to take you back first to 1780. It's really not that long ago in human history, 1780. And in 1780, if you, if you looked at a map of the outer solar system, the map of the outer solar system uh, would show you, well, it would show you uh, Jupiter and Saturn. It's going on. <laughs> it's lurking. Okay. It's scary when I can't see what's going on back here. Um, so the, the, the map of the outer solar system would show you, you know, Jupiter is out there and Saturn. Saturn was the edge of the solar system, the last known planet in the solar system. It had been that way for all of human history. And, you know, I, I don't know. I've never been able to find any written record of anybody speculating whether there should or shouldn't be other planets beyond Saturn. Uh, I, I, I don't know, so, so, but maybe people thought that there should be another planet out there. Maybe they didn't, but in 1781, William Herschel was charting stars in the sky, and he would, he would draw where they were, making charts of these stars, with, using his big telescope that he had developed, and he got to this one spot in the sky, and there was something that looked like a little bit like a star, but his telescope was good. He had, had really good optics in his telescope, and he could tell that it was a little bit fuzzy. Fuzzy, you know, there are fuzzy things in the sky. There are these things that we call planetary nebulae that are, that are uh, fuzzy balls of gas in the sky really far away. He thought it was probably one of those. He came back and took a look at it the next day and it had moved. And as soon as you see something in the sky move from one night to the next, you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that this thing is in our own solar system. And he was reluctant to call it a planet. He didn't, he didn't know for sure. He thought, okay, we've seen things move. New things in the solar system have been discovered before comets. Comets come in, they're fuzzy. You see them here, they move across the sky, they get brighter. So he, he kind of thought maybe it's a comet. He wasn't sure. He tracked it for a while, other people tracked it for a while. It looked like it was really far away, beyond Saturn, which is pretty amazing to, to think that there could be something out there. Again, he still remained reluctant to think it was actually uh, a planet out there, but, but eventually everybody realized it was really far away and started discussing the fact that he had discovered this new, this new planet. Um, but people were still not sure. So they tried to track it down. The way to know if it was really a planet versus a comet was to see if it went in a circular orbit around the sun like the planets do, or if it was like a comet and it came in and went further out. Now the problem is to calculate the orbit of a planet of something that far takes, you know, a couple hundred years. You have to watch it go all the way out of the sun and nobody really wanted to wait that long. But it turns out Uranus had been observed earlier. In 1820, a, a um, French astronomer, Alexis Bouvard, um, wrote this great book. Uh, he went back and tracked down all the times in the past when Uranus had accidentally been observed. So I love this book for the, the, the name is not very exciting. Uh, I can't see from it. Astronomical Tables, Jupiter, Saturn, and Uranus. 
Um, but the best part is Bouvard, when he writes a book, look at all these titles. Uh, Order of the Region, uh, Royal Legion of Honor, Academy of Sciences, and Bureau of Longitudes, Royal Science in Munich, uh, London. I'm, from now on, I'm writing all these in all my, my books um, that you see. So he went and tracked down every time Uranus had been observed. And what he found is that you could find Uranus in the past. It was discovered in 1781, um, and he used this, these formulas. There'll be a test later on. Everybody should memorize <laughs> these things. Um, he figured out this is his theory of where Uranus should be. And what he did is he, he took the observations from 1781 up to, to 1820, and he then went backwards in time. And he realized that if you go backwards in time, you could find, well, here's, here's what you could find. 1781, it was first seen. 1771, he found observations where some astronomer somewhere had been doing what, what, uh, what Herschel did, making charts of the sky, put a star here. But that astronomer did two things not as good as Herschel. One is that that astronomer's telescope was not as good, so that he didn't notice that it was a fuzzy dot instead of a, a, a star. And also, he didn't go back a second night and double check. Any of these astronomers who had gone back a second night and double checked would have seen it move, but none of them did. 1771, there was a star there where no star had ever been charted before or since. Uh, Bouvard said, hey, maybe that was Uranus. And he went all the way back to 1690 and found observations where an astronomer had cataloged Uranus inadvertently uh, in the right spot, but hadn't gone back and checked and realized that it would have moved the next day. Pretty amazing. So he, so he found all these data, made this, uh, this, this beautiful theory on exactly where Uranus should be. And then he also realized that these are the dates. These are the errors. This is how far away Uranus was from where it was supposed to be. So there's pluses, there's minuses, pluses, pluses, minuses, 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 pluses. So it, you know, sometimes it's a little ahead in its orbit. Sometimes it's a little behind. And Bouvard is a theoretical astronomer, theoretical astrophysicist, uh, uh, assumes what all theoretical astrophysicists do, even to this day. And he says it right here. Um, basically says like, well, my theory is perfect, but the data are probably wrong. <laughs> um, and he does say, however, down here somewhere, uh, there is an alternative uh, possibility, which is that there might be another planet out there that's tugging Uranus along. And so he suggests that starting in 1820, people should look really carefully. And, and if, if it were really just that the observations were bad, then people would start to look more carefully. And starting in 1820, everything would be perfect. Well, starting in 1820, people started looking more carefully, and the observations still were not where the prediction was. But uh, let me just knock this sideways to the back. There we go. Um, Bouvard realized from 1820 till about 1840, as the observations started getting progressively further and further from where they were supposed to be, uh, Bouvard realized, as did pretty much everybody at the time, that there was another planet out there. This is actually something that's not very well known. We'll, we'll talk about the discovery of Neptune in, in uh, 1845 here in a minute. But it was people knew that there was a planet out there. The hard part was not to figure out that there was a planet. Bouvard had figured out that there was a planet. The hard part was to figure out where that planet was. So Bouvard in Paris handed his data to Le Verrier, also there in Paris, and said, figure out where this planet is, man. And uh, Le Verrier sat down and made these huge equations trying to figure out perturbations of Neptune, uh, of Uranus, and realized basically is that Uranus is going around the sun, and if there's a planet out here as Uranus is going around the sun, when Uranus is here, it gets tugged further ahead in its orbit. When it's here, it gets pulled backwards in its orbit, and that explains the pluses and the minuses systematically. Le Verrier presented this work at the, uh, the, basically the National Academy in Paris, and all of the Parisian astronomers clapped their hands and said, nice work, Le Verrier. Uh, and Le Verrier is like, let's, let's go find it. And they're like, oh, no, 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 no. Um, because, again, this is these things you can't quite find written down, but I think it's true. I think even then, people did not really believe that you could do something like predict a planet 
based on based on math. That's just crazy. Like it was good math. They were impressed with this math, but they didn't actually think you could use it to predict a planet. So they just you know wanted to give him a medal for nice math, but not look at it. So instead, he um, you know he sends an email to a buddy in Berlin. Uh, maybe not email. I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> sends an email and says, uh, hey, I have a prediction. I think there's a planet, and I think it's right there. And the Berlin Observatory opens up the telescope. Um, and in the very first night, in the very sp first spot they look, there it is, Neptune. Which is, to this day, uh, you know, everybody who's a scientist has their own one thing in their field that they think is the most amazing thing ever. This is it for me. I think that that moment when Le Verrier said, there's a planet, and uh, in the, unit, uh, the Berlin Observatory opened up the telescope and there was a planet. It, it doesn't get any more amazing than that. That slammed the door shut on this belief that math can't be used to actually talk about the universe around us. This is a planet discovered, as they said at the time, uh, at the point of a pencil, which is, uh, which is a pretty amazing thing. So, Le Verrier, not surprisingly, and, and quite deservedly, gets super famous. Uh, and, as happens all the time, some dude gets famous for finding a planet. Everybody else says, I'm going to find me a planet and get famous too. Uh, so people, even literally within um, a month, people started suggesting that there was another planet out beyond Neptune, a ninth planet out beyond Neptune, based on perturbations. Because you could do the same thing with Neptune, find Neptune further back. You could look at the perturbations of Uranus and find perturbations back there. So it really was uh, everybody, starting in about 1846, went kind of planet crazy. Um, I tried once collecting all the different places I could find somebody predicting a planet, and they are, uh, there's too many to find. Um, most of them are on the verge of crazy, um, but some of them were not crazy. Some of them were based on observations of Uranus and Neptune that did suggest there was something going on. And the most famous of these, many people know about, and those were the, the uh, predictions by Percival Lowell that there was this thing that he called Planet X out there, perturbing Neptune. This is Planet X is this thing that perturbs the orbit of Neptune, just like Neptune perturbs the orbit of Uranus. He spent a lot of long time looking for Planet X. He founded the Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, um, and he didn't live long enough to see the, the search for Planet X at Flagstaff really get underway, but uh, Clyde Tombaugh, starting in, in uh, 1929, began surveying the sky looking for Planet X, just like Lowell had predicted, and he took a picture, and there it is. Do you guys see Planet X? Um, well, you probably don't see it, so uh, Tom Bow didn't see it either. He took pictures like this, and he realized that you know he didn't know what Planet X was supposed to look like. If it were a big planet, so Planet X, if it's perturbing Neptune, it's huge. It's the size of Jupiter. Um, and if it was the size of Jupiter, it would actually be a pretty big planet here in the middle. You would see it, just the same way that, that Herschel saw Uranus and knew that there was something funny about it. Everybody thought that you would do the same thing with Planet X. Clyde Tombaugh was, was smart enough to know that he didn't know what he was looking for, which is actually one of the harder things to know. Uh, and so he knew that the way to find Planet X was not to look for it this way, but to do exactly what Herschel did, which is take a picture of the sky, come back the next night, take another picture of the sky, and watch it move. Did you guys see it move? All right, let's try this again. Come the first night, he would see the picture of the sky. The second night, he would see it move. Anybody see it? Yeah. yeah, sure you did. Let's try a third time. Here it is. Maybe? Who thinks they see it? I, I don't know why, but the fourth time, everybody seems to always get it. Here's the fourth time. Uh, picture of the sky. Another picture of the sky. This is it. This is the discovery of Pluto. This is, uh, this is uh, um, Clyde Tombaugh, 1930 systematically scanning the sky, but he, but he actually had just started. I, I told you he started in 1929. He started in late 1929. By early 1930, he had already found it because it was pretty much right where Lowell had predicted it should be. Just pretty amazing because Lowell was looking for this kind of Jupiter-sized planet, um, and so they found it. So what does that mean? Well, um, 1930, headlines of the New York Times. 
Uh, ninth planet discovered on the edge of the solar system. Lies far beyond Neptune, all true. So far, so good. Um, sighted 25 years after Percival Lowell started searching, also true. Uh, special photo telescope, I'm not sure what that means. Um, makes thorough check, good, nice astronomers. Here's my favorite part, the sphere possibly larger than Jupiter <laughs> meets predictions. Those are two deadly statements. First one, possibly larger than Jupiter, only wrong by a factor of 250,000. <laughs> um, meets predictions is why it was wrong. This is the way that science can sometimes go wrong. Science can correct itself when it goes wrong this way, but it can sometimes go wrong. If you make a prediction that there's a planet out there, you go look and there's something, yeah, it's got to be what you made the prediction about, right? It can't just be some coincidental tiny little ice ball that sits right there. It must be this planet nearly the size of Jupiter. Um, so it's not nearly the size of Jupiter. And in fact, we now know Uranus and Neptune are not being perturbed at all in their orbits. So there is no planet X that's perturbing them. And so, so this is what we call, well, you know, this is the New York Times. Uh, we call this fake news. Um, <laughs> We expect nothing more from the failing New York Times, uh, even in 1930. Um, but it's really not their fault. It's really astronomers thought this is what was, that was, what was going on out there. Um, so I'm going to show this to you again. Even at the time, so Clyde Tombaugh actually uh, was not, did not buy into the hype that it was possibly larger than Jupiter. And he actually was pretty concerned about how small it was. So small that I've lost it. Is it, uh, is it that one? That one? I don't know where it is. I can find the second one. The second one, it, there it is. Down there. Uh, is that? No. I don't know. I don't know where it is. So he was so concerned that it was so small, so he continued looking for another um, 20 years and found, found nothing else out there and was always a little bit suspicious about this thing that they had called Planet X. Uh, although he was quite vehement that it was actually a planet. It, it was called a planet because, well, People thought it was possibly the size of Jupiter. And well, you know, there was nothing else out there. And so what else are you going to call it? So, so a planet it was. You know, this whole debate about uh, uh, what, whether Pluto should be a planet or not, one of the things that's lost often is just how small Pluto really is compared to the planets in the solar system. So I like to show this one just for fun. Uh, here are the actual sizes. You never see things in their actual sizes. Uh, my daughter had this lunchbox when she was a kid that, that had all the planets on it, including Pluto, because my friends thought it was funny to give my daughter things with Pluto as a planet on it. Um, it's true. Uh, and all of the planets are about the same size. Jupiter's a little bigger than Pluto, but not much, you know. So you get this really wrong impression of the planets in most popular things. But you rarely see them at their real sizes. Here they are. Uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Ur Jupiter, Saturn, Mercury, Venus, Earth, <laughs> Mars. Here are the asteroids. Is there series, little spacecraft in orbit around series right this very minute? Um, you know, the, the other asteroids there. Jupiter, huge here in the background in, in yellow. Saturn, funny, in all these, on the lunch boxes, Saturn is always too small because they want to show its rings too. Saturn's actually quite big. Uh, there's Saturn, Uranus, Neptune out here, and Pluto, you have to look really carefully. Don't, don't blink because you might miss it. Um, there it is. So, so Pluto's, Pluto's a good bit smaller than our moon. It really is this tiny little thing out there. But you know, it's a tiny little thing that was the only thing that was out there. So people called it a planet in good faith. And people kept looking for planet X. So at the time, they didn't know that, that Uranus and Neptune were where they were supposed to be. So they kept looking. Uh, astronomers from 1930 onward until about 1990 thought that they were just on the verge of discovering this planet X. And they never did. They never did because, of course, there are no perturbations to Uranus and Neptune. But what was discovered instead were things in the same vicinity as Pluto. I'm going to show you where Pluto is. Uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. And remind you, Pluto's got this crazy orbit. The other reason it was kind of weird, it's got this crazy orbit that comes way far away, dips inside the orbit of Neptune for a minute. And the strangest thing about Pluto of all for the orbit is that when you look at it on its side, it's tilted. It's tilted by almost 20 degrees compared to the, to the planets. Um, nobody quite knew what to make of that at the time. But again, nobody knew what else to call it. So, so a planet it was and a planet it stayed. So I'm going to show you this. This is the picture that was uh, around 1990 of what was in the outer solar system. Starting in 1992, new objects were found in the outer solar system. This region 
that we now call the Kuiper Belt. There are more than 2,000 of the ob these objects that are known out there now. And their orbits, well, Pluto's was weird. Theirs are just as weird. They're tilted this way, they're tilted that way, they're elongated one way, they're elongated the other way. Pluto is, there's, there's no question at this point in time, you know, even if you are crazy enough to still want to debate whether Pluto's a planet or not, and I'll throw things at you if you do, but um, there's no question that Pluto is part of this population. It's just one of the larger objects that's part of this population out there that's make this bird nest of material that's out there. This is one of the most, I think, astounding discoveries in the outer solar system of, of the past 30 years, all these objects. And we've gone from having just those small numbers of objects to, if you have to look down here again, so there's Pluto, and most of them are smaller. There's one that's the same size as Pluto, more massive, tiny bit smaller. This Eris um, that, that, that I found uh, a decade ago. But many, many objects that are out there that are, that are approaching the size of Pluto. Um, it's just one of those many objects that are out there. The interesting thing to me about this, this Kuiper Belt region is that the discovery of the Kuiper Belt gave us a new window into what else was going on in the outer part of the solar system. So before, people had spent uh, 150 years trying to figure out if there was another planet by looking at Uranus and Neptune. And now we have thousands of objects that we can look at to see what might be going on at the edge of the solar system. The very first thing that we found that really struck us as strange in this region of the Kuiper Belt was this object called Sedna. Sedna, um, we found this back in 2002. It was one of, our, one of our first sort of really interesting discoveries back in 2002. And the strange thing about Sedna is you can really look at it. Look at the difference between all the orbits here in the Kuiper Belt and here's the orbit of Sedna. One is it goes really far away, so that's weird to begin with. But, but more importantly, it never gets very close to Neptune, it's right here. It, it looks like, in fact, something has pulled it away from where the rest of the Kuiper Belt is. That was really strange back in 2002. We, we, we wondered about this. We had a bunch of crazy ideas. Um, because astronomers for the past uh, 170 years at that point had been saying, oh, gee, it might be a planet. We, of course, also said, oh, gee, it might be a planet. But we, we didn't even take that very seriously. That seemed a little bit crazy. Um, we started looking for other objects like Sedna because it was clear that something was causing this thing to be pulled away. We didn't know what. And uh, we actually didn't, we spent a decade looking for these things and didn't find them. Uh, but one of my, one of my former postdocs, um, along with a collaborator of his, found one like Sedna um, called 2012 VP113. They, they called it Biden. That's not my name. Um, <laughs> Similar, it goes really far away, pulled away from the, from the rest of the Kuiper Belt. Very mysterious. Um, they, just like we said, might be a planet, um, but this was about the, the umpteenth millionth person to say it might be a planet, and, and nobody, nobody took any of it very seriously because you know, people have been saying this forever. Interesting thing happened at this point is that, is that inspired by, uh, by, by these guys having found that object, we started looking more carefully at the most distant objects in the solar system in this Kuiper Belt region. We realized that if you, if you looked at the six most distant objects in the solar system, all of them looked like they were kind of pulled away in one direction. And it's a little bit stranger too. They're not just pulled off in one direction. If you look at them to the side, they're also tilted all a little bit. This direction compared to the plane of the solar system. It's, it's only six objects, and so a lot of people uh, might look at that and think, yeah, six, small number, and it is a small number. Um, but you can try to calculate the probability that these things would, would be all pulled off in the same direction instead of, they should be, if, if they're pulled off somewhere, they should be randomly, there's, there's no reason they should stay in one direction. We calculated a probability, we came up with something like one in a million that they would all be pointing in that direction and tilted down like that. You can quibble with how you do those numbers, but it's a strange thing. And um, at this point, I, I walked, four doors down um, my hallway to our, our newest assistant professor that we had there at Caltech, uh, Constantine Batigan, uh, who, is, who actually was my grad student um, for a couple years before that, but turns out it was pretty obvious he was smarter than me, so we had to make him a professor instead of a grad student. Uh, and I'm like, Constantine, what, what the heck is going on? Um, he's like, well, you know, anybody else who sees this, they're gonna say, must be a planet. 
because everybody always says it must be a planet. So we decided we were going to prove it wasn't a planet because only crazy people talk about planets. Um, so we tried for about, for about six months, we tried everything we could to prove that this is not caused by a planet and we couldn't do it. Uh, which is different from what everybody else in the past did. The first, in the past, it was kind of like, well, maybe a planet, maybe a planet. We're like, okay, this can't be a planet. But it had to be a planet. Turns out that if you have a planet, well, we thought, uh, a planet on, let's see, I need to go, yeah. Remember how these were all pointing off in this direction? We figured that the way to make a planet, make all these things stay pointed off in this direction was we, we like to think of it as the mother planet. The planet had to kind of hug all of these objects and keep them enclosed and not let them escape, otherwise they'd want to escape around. So we envisioned, I'll show you, we, we envisioned this one planet doing a very specific thing and we thought, okay, let's, let's do some computer simulations. We'll, we'll take uh, 100,000 random objects that we throw out there that are like Kuiper Belt objects in our computer and we'll take one big planet and we'll see what the planet does. And the computer simulations look something like this. Here's, here's the planet, the orbit of the planet stays right here. Each one of these things is one of these objects in the Kuiper Belt that's moving around, the orbits move around. One of the reasons why I say nothing should be stuck in place is you can see the orbits circulate with time, they move all over the place. We thought we would capture objects, right? here. They should stay right here. So let's see them get captured. Here's one that goes, it's no. How about that? No. No. The green ones are close. The close ones, nothing happens to them. But the distant ones are supposed to capture, no. 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 Not that, no. No. This one, no. No. They keep getting ejected. There aren't very many plant, uh, Kuiper Belt objects left because most of them have been ejected. And look what happens. They're all over here. Mostly, a planet over here, completely contrary to our intuition, <laughs> captures objects in the opposite direction of where that planet is. And this simulation is now run for four billion years. This is, you just saw four billion years of solar system history. And after four billion years, when it stops, it'll be four billion years. After four billion years, all of the objects that are left are spewed off in this direction and the planet is off in this direction. It was, again, totally counterintuitive, but now when, once we realized, once we thought about it, it was obvious. Once we were shown by the computer, it was obvious. It's that the only, the only way to keep the, these things off in this direction is because you know how, how planets work. They spend a lot of time out here, and then they come here and they go fast like this and slow and fast like this and slow. The planet's doing the same thing, slow then fast. The only way that you can stick around is if you spend as little time as possible close to each other. If you ever get close to this planet, you're in, you're in bad shape, you get uh, you're ejected. So these guys stick around because they never get close to the planet. This was sort of an astounding thing that we didn't, we didn't realize. So it means that these six objects that we had suggests that a planet is off like this, and the fact that these six are all tilted in one direction also shows us that the planet is tilted in the same way too. So we know the direction that the planet is, is pulled off in. We also know the tilt of the planet relative to the, to the sun, which is critical for helping us figure out where it really is. So at this stage, uh, I would say that we, we consider this a cute idea. You know, Astronomers, as I said, astronomers have been saying, must be a planet, must be a planet, for 170 years by this point. And pretty much anyone who stands up and says, must be a planet, everybody else dismisses them and says they're crazy. And we really did not feel comfortable standing up and say, must be a planet. I, you know, this is, I would call this compelling uh, or interesting. Interesting, but not compelling. Uh, provocative, but not convincing. Um, so we really were looking for something to convince us. So we, we looked really carefully at our computer simulations and we found, we were looking for predictions we could make. Um, and we found this interesting prediction, which is that if you have these objects uh, off in this direction like this and a planet off like this, every time our computer simulations showed us that you should also have orbits of objects that get twisted by 90 degrees compared to the to the plane of the solar system in, in both directions. If these, if these are all the objects that are all aligned in one way, you get objects that go like this, that almost look like wings or something on the side of the solar system. And, and that was pretty weird because we had never seen things like that before in the solar system. And, and uh, we actually worried about this for, for a couple months because 
Well, making a prediction and then realize that our prediction did not exist pretty much killed the theory. So we were, we were back to the drawing board trying to figure out what was going on until one day when we realized we'd been looking uh, at only a limited set of data of objects in the outer solar system. This was entirely my fault, and I, I, it seems stupid now that I think about it, is that we were only looking at the most distant things that also never came closer than Neptune, because we figured once it gets too close to Neptune, bad things happen. But if you're perpendicular, to the solar system, you don't really care where Neptune is because you come into the solar system so quickly. So when, when we look to see if there were any objects that are perpendicular but also come in closer to Neptune, we realize that there are five objects perpendicular to the solar system and they come in closer than Neptune and they go out really far away. And so I remember this moment, uh, Constantine and I were sitting in my office at the moment we realized these objects existed and I was like, okay, I'm gonna plot exactly where they are and if they are here, it's gonna blow my mind. We plotted where they were and I'm gonna just show you on this scale where they are. They are exactly where we predicted um, that they should be, exactly in these, these wings coming off to the sides. They're perpendicular, they go off perpendicular to the direction of this. This is, to me, exactly what you do as a scientist. You make a theory, you make a prediction. Uh, an explanation of something that you've already seen is easy. We could explain the six objects that were aligned. That's easy. Making a prediction and having it come true, this is what turns something into an interesting idea into you know, a real viable hypothesis. This is the moment when my, my jaw, uh, it hit the floor. I, I, I think Constantine and I sat in my office for a second staring at each other as both of us suddenly realized that you know, our cute idea, there's a planet out there. This is no longer a cute idea. There's, there's, there's sure enough a planet out there. Um, so this is, this is the stage we were in a year ago when we first uh, published our paper talking about the existence of this planet. And um, we, made, we made predictions. We predicted that, there, that new objects discovered would fit the same pattern. We would find more objects off in this direction. We'd find more of these. And we also realized after some additional computer simula simulation, there should actually be a few, a small number, that go off in this direction exactly the same as the planet. Uh, it turns out these are the hardest to find. So no, no new ones of these have been found. But of the one, two, three, I'm going to show you. So in the last year, four new distant objects have been discovered. It's, it's slow going. There are only six before in the preceding 15 years. So four in one year is pretty good. And let me show you where they are. First, here are the six that we had. Uh, you can, I'll just, yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six. The three new ones that were first discovered uh, blew my mind. Here they are. One goes really far away. Those are perfectly aligned. And here's the one that's aligned in the same way. Here's the, seven, the fourth exactly there. This is, I like to think of this as the scorecard. Uh, we made another prediction. We had the prediction of the perpendicular things. We made a prediction that there would be new ones discovered. Oh, that's terrible. Uh, off in the same direction. And one discovered here. And that they fit exactly where they went. I did a calculation in my head last night of what's the probability of those four being discovered just by chance. And these, these things are a little hard, but I, I came up with something like one in 300, so uh, that they would all line up exactly where they happen to line up. You can, again, we can argue about this number, but it's, it's pretty good. Um, it is very difficult for me to imagine a solar system these days that actually does not have a planet nine in it. Everything that we keep finding continues to point to this planet. Uh, so far, no one has really come up with any viable objections to that there. So I'm, I'm gonna stand here and tell you it's, it's there. Uh, there is a ninth planet out there and now I'm gonna switch from trying to convince you that it's there and tell you how we found out it's there to tell you what, it, what, it, what it's like. Um, Here's what it's like. Well, we don't know what it's like. Uh, okay, so that was short. Um, here's what we know. In those computer simulations that we did, we had to put in a planet to make that thing happen. And if we, we could put in different planets, we could put in planets that went out really far, ones that didn't quite go out as far, ones that were tilted more, tilted less, that were bigger, smaller, and only a limited number of planets actually worked to reproduce what we were looking for. And so that gives us very good constraints on how big this planet has to be. How big is not exactly fair. It's how massive. All we know is its gravitational effect. So it could be 
small but really dense and have exactly the same effect as big um, but, but not very dense. But we know how massive it is. Here's what we know. It is just about 10 times the mass of the Earth. So to think about this for a second, I, every once in a while people ask me like, oh, so are we going to have a debate about is this a planet or not a planet? This is 5,000 times more massive than Pluto. This is not like, a, oh, it's a little bigger than Pluto, so it's a planet. This is like a real actual planet out there at the edge of the solar system. 10 times the mass of the Earth. 10 times the mass of the Earth is pretty exciting um, for a couple of reasons. One is we talked about planets around other stars and we talked about what we have to think about differently about our own solar system now that we know about planets around other stars. One of the things that we know about planets around other stars is that planets that are about 10 times the mass of the Earth are about the most common thing in the galaxy. Um, we don't have any. We didn't think we had any in our solar system. We have the Earth, which is precisely one times the mass of the Earth. Um, <laughs> And we have, we have Uranus and Neptune, which are 16 and 17 times the mass of the Earth. We didn't have anything in between. And so I used to teach, I still teach this class, but I would say in this class I teach about, about introduction to planetary science. I would talk about planets around other stars. And I would say, wow, isn't it interesting? You know, we, we are missing this most common type of planet uh, in the galaxy. It turns out, I think we're not. 10 times the mass of the Earth is exactly what we have. Um, What's it like? It's an interesting thing between, so is it, is, it a, is it a big Earth? Is it a solid object that's 10 times the mass of the Earth? Or is it a little Neptune? Is it a, is it a gas giant like Neptune? We don't know the answer for sure, but I think it is safe to assume um, that we can use planets around other stars to answer that question for you. I told you that, that it's the most common type of planet in the galaxy. In almost every case that we can figure out, something that's 10 times the mass of the Earth is a gas giant. It's a, it's a miniature Neptune rather than a giant Earth. So when you look at it, it probably looks something like this. Earth here uh, at one Earth. There's Neptune and, and Uranus at, at 15 and 17. Neptune is probably a little smaller. I'm sorry, Planet 9 is probably a little bit smaller than Neptune, but made out of the same sort of gaseous stuff. The Neptune is. I have to tell you, this is exciting to me just for the fact that when we find it, we will get to study this thing that's like this common planet in the galaxy, and we'll get to study it uh, right up here, close, sort of close, um, in our own solar system. The fact that it's 10 times the mass of the Earth also gives us, I think, a huge hint as to where it came from. Um, you can't form planets that far out, as far as we know. And yet, around other stars, we often see planets that are that far away. We think one way that they get formed is that they form in closer, like where Jupiter and Saturn and Uranus and Neptune form, and sometimes get scattered outward. If they formed in that region by Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and they got scattered early on, we would predict, without even knowing this, we would predict that they would be something like 10 times the mass of the Earth. That's a natural mass scale out there. Um, so I think this is pointing to where it came from too. It's just part of our own solar system got ejected out there and it's been lurking at the edge ever since then. Okay, so where is it? We gotta go find this thing. Um, let's go find it. So how are we gonna find it? Well, there are a lot of people now that we've, we've announced this, uh, the, the existence of this thing, um, a lot of people are looking. We have tried, we've tried really hard to make it as easy for everybody to find as possible. Um, we, we, we continue to, uh, I'm serious about this, we continue to publish all of our predictions on exactly where to look because I, I want somebody to find it. I would love to find it myself, but I would rather that somebody else finds it tomorrow than that I find it in five years. I, would, I want this thing to get found. So we keep on publishing our predictions. I know of at least a dozen teams who are looking to find it. A lot of people are doing very clever things that we wouldn't have thought of. This is also another good reason for us publishing our predictions because people have some, some really smart ideas. We're doing it in what I have to say is boring old school. Boring old school is you go off to a telescope, you take a picture of the sky, come back the next night, take a picture of the sky, look to see what moves. It's, it's, uh, it's Herschel all over again. You would think 
that uh, since 1781 we could have gotten a little better than Herschel. And I, and I kind of hope so. I hope actually somebody finds it in one of these clever ways. But in the meantime, we're off to in Herschel. Here's Mauna Kea, my, my favorite telescopes I talked about earlier, the uh, CAC telescopes on, on Mauna Kea. Um, our uh, Caltech is one of the partial. I was one of the partners in the Keck telescopes, so I, I, I'm a lot. I'm on those telescopes a lot. Turns out, totally useless for looking for Planet Nine. Um, best telescopes in the world for many, many things. Planet Nine, not one of them. But Subaru telescope right next door, best telescope in the world for looking at Planet Nine. Subaru is the Japanese national telescope, um, and conveniently. Keck and Subaru uh, each have specialized in different things in astronomy, and they switch. They they are willing to trade time back and forth, and so I've been using the Subaru telescope um, through trades with Keck. The reason that Subaru is so good is because what you want. You need a big telescope because it's pretty far away, pretty faint. But you need a big telescope that can look at a big swath of sky at once. So the Keck telescope, the biggest swath of sky it can look at in any one picture is, is about this big, literally. Put your fingers together and look at the light, and it's, that's as much as you can see, tiny, tiny bit. The Subaru telescope has this huge camera. The huge camera, this is a camera, this is not a telescope. The camera is so big that it's as big as an anime character. Um, <laughs> It includes, this This is a lens, this is, I believe it's still true, that this is the largest uh, lens ever built. Uh, a large, like, scientific application, high quality lens. The lens was actually built by Canon, and this lens, the light goes through the lens and goes up to the actual uh, detector that's up here. The telescope is, is you know, 10 stories down, down here, and this camera covers so much sky, well, I'll show you here, it covers this much sky if, um, if that's the full moon, which, which means, so Keck was this, and Subaru is about that. Okay, so that doesn't seem like a lot, but you can imagine if you have a pretty big swath of sky to cover, you can kind of go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We've calculated um, that it's gonna take us about 20 nights on the Subaru telescope to cover the area where we think Planet Nine is. Um, 20 nights is a great number. 20 nights, some people say, 20 nights, how come you're not done already? And the answer is, even though this is without a question the most important astronomical search currently undertaken right now, uh, <laughs> other astronomers have not seen the light, always. And some of them think that the thing they're doing is the most important thing. I don't know why. Um, so. We have to share the telescope. Also, it's a Japanese telescope. Uh, I don't work in Japan, so I, I have to do these roundabout ways of getting time. So it's, it's going to take us two, three years to, to get those 20 nights on the Subaru telescope, but we will. We'll cover this area of the sky. In the meantime, somebody else might find it. I just want to show you this picture because it's my favorite picture. Of, uh, this is me, and I was talking to you about Constantine, our, our smartest guy in the world, um, who's down the street from me, down the hall from me. He is a terrible, terrible astronomer. Um, he's never been to a telescope before in his life. Um, uh, you can't tell, but he's having to breathe oxygen because he can't breathe at 14,000 feet. What kind of astronomer can't breathe at 14,000 feet? And uh, it's a good thing he was wearing the hard hat because he ran into the telescope a couple of times. Um, the super telescope is beautiful. The camera, is that thing right there? And it's much further away than it looks even in this picture. It's way, way, way the heck up there. But we've been out there looking, and I just want to I just want to um, uh, end this for you by by telling you where to go look because, okay, you can't see it. You can actually, there, there are some, some of these projects, if I said the very clever ones, some of them are these uh, citizen science projects where you can go onto a website and start to look for things. Um, there's one called uh, backyardplanets.com. If you go there, you can start to look at images and start to look, look for things that are moving. I, I mean, wouldn't it be the best story in the world if the ninth planet is found not by you know dorky astronomers at a big telescope like this, but by by some school kid in Africa on backyardplanets.com who then discovers this planet. I think that's I, I am rooting for these guys. I would love to find it. Don't get me wrong, but I'm I'm rooting for all these citizen science things. I just think that'd be the coolest possible thing in the world. So go check these out. But if if you find it, you know, tell some school kid in some other country. Um, <laughs> in the meantime, okay, you can't necessarily go look, but I want you to go look out. Uh, tonight it might be a little bit late, the sun is already set, this part of the sky is about to set, but, but it's sunset, even right now if you go quickly. Go look out at the western horizon and, and what do you see? You see something that looks about like this. You see, I would say, the most recognizable horizon, uh, uh, constellation in the sky. Uh, anybody? 
It's Orion. Thank you. Uh, if you could put an astronomical object anywhere in the sky where you could tell people, go look, you would put it in Orion. So you could say, Planet 9, it's over in Orion, go look. Didn't quite work out, but it was close. Um, so Orion's right here, Taurus is, here's Taurus right here, uh, the Pleiades, Aldebaran, the Pleiades. Uh, the Pleiades in Japanese is Subaru, which is the name of the telescope, which is why your car has that little symbol on it. Your car does. Oh, I have a Subaru. I, I had to. I, so if, if you buy a Subaru, you get one night on the Subaru telescope. So it's a special deal these days. So we can all pool if anybody else has Subarus. Um, so, so our calculations suggest that Planet Nine is in this very small swath of sky. Um, right here. Actually, our new calculations put it a little bit further this way. I need to move this. I pick up this thing and move it right over here. But it goes, it goes right through Taurus, right on, right next to Orion. Um, okay, so this is, you know, you guys have sat here very nicely uh, for 45 minutes listening, listening to what I had to say and looking at computer simulations and listening to what I say. But I, but I want you to stop for a second, and I want you to think about this. There. I'm telling you there is, I'm not saying probably, there is a ninth giant planet out in our solar system. And it's right now, it's, it's right about here in the sky. If you go out um, right when we're done, and you don't go to the observatory, but you should go to the observatory because uh, you can actually, it looks like it's gonna be clear. If you go out here, you find Orion, find Taurus, and it's right there. I just want you to, you can't see it, but if you're like me, which with luck you're not, you can, you can feel it. You can just look there and think, wow, there is this, you know, so in 1780, we didn't know there were any planets that we couldn't see. We found two more giant ones we can see. There's a third one that's just on the verge of being discovered that you can see. So, so don't, don't forget to do this. Go actually look at Orion, look at Taurus, and think about this planet out there. Because it's going to be discovered in a couple of years, and you won't remember what it's like to have not known exactly where it is. But I want you to have this moment before you do. So I'm going to just end um, by, by where I started here with the, uh, so this is why I couldn't, I couldn't talk about Planet Nine from outer space, um, even though that was not the question, apparently. Uh, but as, as you mentioned, this is, of course, Planet, Plan Nine from outer space, widely known as the worst movie ever made, yeah. right? This is you can like look it up on Google. Worst movie ever made, and look go Plan Nine from outer space. Literally true. Uh, Ed Wood movie, but so, and it was uh, the 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 plot is I don't even know, I tried to watch it. You can watch it's the whole thing's on YouTube. You can watch it if anybody can get through it. It's pretty. I mean, you think oh it's going to be funny. It's not even. It's like terrible. Um, <laughs> There are there are there are aliens and zombies and all these and vampiras and stuff like that. Uh, but the most amazing thing about Ed Wood, in addition to having made this terrible terrible movie, um, was his 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 he was prescient in 19 what, what was the year of it 68 or something I don't actually don't know exactly the year the movie was 19, but 50 uh, 20 I don't know. But at the time, so there's there's these zombies. Here's the zombies, or like there are people digging up graves and stuff. And there's this whole graveyard scene, and there's this poster. This was just taken from the poster for Plan Plan Nine from Outer Space. The thing that amazes me about this poster from the 1950s um, is is the is this graveyard scene. If you look really carefully, um, see that little little tombstone? It's um, right there. All right, keep it. Who knew? Ed, Ed Wood knew all along. Uh, really impressive. So anyway, I thank you for coming. Go look that way when you're done. I'd be happy to take a few questions for everybody. So I'm going to start right here because I can see you. So the question of names. No. No, 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 you can't ask questions about names. That is bad luck. Astronomers, as with anybody who I think is affected by things like weather, astronomers are really superstitious. Um, and naming something or even thinking about names ahead of time, bad luck. I will not entertain. I honestly have no names in mind. I will not entertain anything about names. And I will throw things at people who even mention names. So I recommend, unless you're in the back row, I recommend not talking about names. Next question. I'm going to go speak in the back row, right there. Yeah. How long do you think it would have taken for that Planet Nine to get out to the, uh, the outer uh, solar 
galaxies. So how long does it take Planet Nine to get to the outer solar system? Well, it, presumably it started in a relatively circular orbit like Uranus and Neptune, Jupiter and Saturn, and then it got too close to Jupiter or too close to Saturn, maybe even Uranus or Neptune. And when that happened, it, it got ejected, it's got scattered. So it goes out like this. And it just takes half of an orbit to get out there. The orbit, we think, is on the order of 15,000 years. So 7,000 years, it's all the way out there. There is one trick, though, that I, I uh, tried to finesse, which is that it goes out here, but then it comes back to where it came from. And so the hard thing to figure out is how to make it go on an orbit like this so it doesn't come back into the planets. And there are, we think we have some schemes, but that's really uh, an open question for research. But that first ejection is pretty instantaneous. How long it then takes to settle into its current orbit, we're not as sure about. It's aphelion. It's aphelion is probably about 1,000 AU. Aphelion is the furthest it goes away from the sun. Yes? Hey. Yeah. Uh. Given that orbital period, do people start thinking it might be uh, a nemesis candidate? So, so um, speaking of crazy people and planets, um, <laughs> so there are many other things that you might have heard about of planets. There's Planet X. People will still talk about Planet X. There's no Planet X. There's Nemesis. Nemesis was a fun one uh, that people talked about starting in the in the 70s and in through the 80s. Nemesis was supposed to be this massive planet in, in, out in the Oort cloud that when it comes in close, it perturbs comets, they come in, you know, there's extinction, there's this 29 million year periodic extinctions. Turns out the, tw the, the extinctions are not actually periodic, they don't tend to all be from things that are impacting. So, so particularly if you talk to the, to the geologists about extinctions and impacts and stuff, they will kind of laugh you out of the room uh, if, you, if you start talking about nemesis. People have looked pretty hard. Forget about whether it's nemesis or not. There's still, it's perfectly plausible that there might be a brown dwarf, large Jupiter-sized thing out in the Oort cloud. These days, there have been a couple of really nice uh, spacecraft that have, have gone and searched, amongst other things, and the best of these is NASA's um, WISE mission, which has had a, a very serious solar system um, component, and they have looked really hard to see if there's anything out there. And there really is, it's pretty clear now that the nemesis idea certainly is not true because of the geology, but there's, it's pretty clear there's nothing else really big. By really big, I mean Jupiter size and larger. So Planet Nine is about 10 times the mass of the Earth. Jupiter is, is more like 300. So Jupiter is still huge compared to this tiny little thing. Yes. How close does it get to the Earth? I guess I don't have a good sense of distance. Yeah, so the question is how close is Planet Nine compared to the Oort Cloud? I didn't show you the Oort Cloud on any of my slides because uh, the Oort Cloud would be you know, you know, at the next museum over. Um, so Planet Nine, the furthest it gets is probably something like a thousand times, maybe 1,500 times the distance from the Earth to the Sun. The Oort cloud, where you know, some of the most distant comets come from, the Oort cloud is halfway between us and the nearest star. That's, it's something like 100,000 times the distance from the Earth to the Sun instead of 1,000 times. So we still have to go a far factor of 100 further to get out there. So even though Planet Nine is so far away, it's still, it's still really a tiny, tiny part of our, our solar system neighborhood. Yes. Yep. One of the slides where you show the masses, uh, you show that the length of the years between 10,000 and 20,000 uh, Earth years. So, what happens when it gets that far? Is it still, can it still be found? And so, yeah, so the question is if Planet 9 has something I said before, like something like a 15,000 year orbit. Um, what happens if it's on the far end of its 15,000 year orbit? Well, the answer we will tell you soon because I'm pretty sure it's on the far end of its 15,000 year orbit. Um, when it is closer, it's actually pretty bright and so bright that we should have found it already. So the, one of the reasons that we have this one swath to look at is that we, 
we assume that it would have been found otherwise, and so it must be out there. Um, it's still well within reach of things like the Subaru telescope. For the Subaru telescope, we have to uh, we take a picture of the sky, um, and that picture of the sky, we, we expose our cameras for 90 seconds. And that, that's how long it'll take us to be able to detect Planet 9, even if it's as far away as it possibly could be. So, so that's why we need big telescopes, but once we have the big telescopes with the big cameras, we are well within range of finding it. Yes? What's the protocol for what you discovered? Like, do you call it the, the time? So the question is, what is the protocol for when you discover a planet? Um, there is none, really, because there hasn't been a planet discovered or even claimed to have been discovered since 1930. And, and, uh, the, but the official, the, the official announcement would come from um, the International Astronomical Union. Uh, they have, well, it's interesting, they have, they have something called the Minor Planet Center, which is where, which keeps track of everything that's discovered. Of course, that's because they don't assume that there are any major planets left to be discovered. Um, it would be interesting to know the answer to that question. I suspect, so if, if I were to find it tomorrow, uh, we would probably pretty much just announce it more or less right away without worrying about what a protocol is because, you know, we'll figure out the protocols later. Really, everyone needs to know that it's out there and there's no, it, it, this is not something that there would be a question about, you know, is it really true that it's there or not? You would like, yes, it's there. Here's the orbit. You can calculate it. Um, so I think probably we would just, just go all out, you know, as opposed to waiting or trying to get some committee together because then it would, it would leak out and then I think we would just, I'd probably be Twitter is the answer. <laughs> In the grand scheme of things, uh, yes. So, so question is: Have I mined the online archives for serendipitous discoveries? Uh, and the answer is yes, and other people have too. Um, I even did it accidentally four years ago before I knew I was doing it. So the the. I'm happy to say the best paper on an all-sky search for distant objects is one that I wrote three years ago. Um, it, and it's true. I didn't know I was looking for Planet 9 at the time. I just thought, yeah, wouldn't that be cool if I could find something? Um, we didn't find something, and that's one of the reasons why I know it's not uh, very close. But that didn't go very deep. There are a lot of, a lot of people have taken a lot of data in a lot of different places. And if you could figure out the way to stitch it together like Bouvard did for Uranus, you could find it. So we're, we're working on it. It's hard. Um, we have our own, we have some archives we're looking through, other people are looking for some. I, I, I want it to be found that way. I think that this is the era of, of big data, e even in astronomy. And I think that if we, if we can't find it in some cool computational archival data way, then, then we, are, we are failures as astronomers, which probably we are. So that's easy. Yes? question is what what other fields am I am I pulling inspiration from when I'm thinking computationally and the unfortunate answer is I'm not I should be uh, I don't know this is maybe why we haven't found it yet and this is also why I actually think that some of these other people with clever ideas um, might find it before us um, I'm, I'm sort of still trying all my old school, you know, so I said it'd be sort of sad if we have to resort to Herschel, but really I'm trying to resort to Bouvard instead and, you know, just try to go back and go back and try to find it again and again. There must be more clever data scientists than me out there. Um, that seems obvious. Uh, it's, it's rich. It's out there. So you, I'm, I am totally serious about the fact that we have, we, we, can, we continue to update where you should look. We're about to publish an update in the next week or so. Uh, and all this stuff, I mean, it's, it moves too fast to, to publish in scientific papers anymore. So I just put it on a blog. Go look on my blog in the next week or so. It'll tell you where to look. Um, someone figured out how to do it better than me. It's, it's, the data exists. The techniques probably exist. It takes a smart person to marry those two uh, in ways that haven't happened yet. But there are smart people out there. Go do it. Okay, let's see. Oh. 
I'm going to go very top up here. So I, I can't hear you. You have to scream at me. When you fly at night, could there be life? Whoa, okay. When I find Planet Nine, could there be life? So the first answer is probably no, because like, like the other giant planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, you know, the big gas giants we don't think are capable of supporting life. And so, so I would say no. But then we think, oh, but wait, we, you know, earlier I talked about Europa. Europa has more liquid water than the Earth does. Uh, there, e there could well be life in Europa that has nothing to do with life on the Earth that, that form there. Enceladus, Enceladus we know has all this liquid water and it has all the nutrients for life. Maybe life's are there. There's no reason why Planet Nine could not have an icy moon like these other two that, that could well have life on it. Does it? I have no idea. One of the very first things I'm excited to do as soon as we find Planet Nine is to, is to swing the Hubble Space Telescope towards it and take a look and see if we can find any moons around it and start to, to, to find out what else might be there. But it's, a, it's an exciting question to think about. Hey, one more question. Ooh, I have one more question. So I'm going to go, if they're kids, I'm going to go for kids. Any kids with questions? Anybody who likes to think they're a kid? Yeah, I can tell. You like to think you're a kid. OK, go ahead. Yeah. The way we detect uh, the exoplanets in other systems is by uh, microlens, but there's no direct light that we can see from the telescope because the star that's bright at this time is really dim. So are we working on some technologies, you know, in directing the telescope by the telescope by thousands of them? Uh, so, the, so the question is about it's, it's two twofold question. One is is about discovery of planets around other stars, and how most of the ways that we find planets around other stars are indirect. We don't see a star and see the planet going around it. Not always. Sometimes we actually see a star and we see a planet going around it. And in those cases, those are the planets that are more like Planet Nine. They're far away, which is why we can see them. So then the question is, are there, are there new techniques that are developing to try to see them? The answer is absolutely yes. People are working really hard to try to block out the light of that central star and see things closer and closer around. And again, I encourage you to come to this June 22nd talk um, from my friend Heather Knutson, who will tell you all about these sorts of things. Then the third part of the question is, can we use any of these new techniques to find Planet Nine? And the answer is no. Um, the reason is no is because it's, it's, our problem is not finding something faint around something bright. Our, find, our problem is, is, is more the needle in the haystack problem. We are looking for something faint and we don't know where to look as opposed to we know where to look but there's a headlight in our face. Um, so we need, you know, really we need, we need the Subaru telescope. The Subaru telescope is perfect for this. It covers a big swath of sky. Uh, it can see faint objects. And we just need to systematically sweep the sky back and forth um, until we find it. And I think we will. I have been, I am, I am maybe overconfident, but it, it would not surprise me if by this time next year it's in the bag. Um, maybe it's maybe that's overconfident. It is overconfident. It's confident. Uh, you know, it depends on things like the weather when you're at the telescope, which you can't control, which is why we're superstitious and we'll not talk about names. Um, but it's so if it's not this year, it's next year or the year after that. You know, I'm not I'm not worried that we need new techniques. The 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 old ones are going to work. Maybe the new ones can go even faster. The, these data ones that people can do those would be cool. But it's. It's out there. Uh, when it's discovered, I want you guys to remember that you know you heard about it before, and you try to remember what it was like when you weren't quite sure if it was really there, and then you see it and you know about it. It's going to be a fun, fun day. Well, thank you, Mike, for a, a great talk. And uh, again, we'd like to thank our sponsors, United Launch Alliance and uh, Aerojet Rocketdyne. And I have been told that the uh, observatory outside will be open for viewing uh, right after the talk. So please uh, feel free to go out there and uh, see what's up tonight. And thank you again for coming and join us uh, in June for our fourth lecture.